Between 1977 and 1986, there were 432 weather-related accidents in the UK civil aviation industry alone. Since then, this figure has risen with by 50% to around 650 accidents in more recent years. Furthermore, in 2013 in the USA, 3 billion US dollars were lost to weather-related incidents in the aviation industry. It is clear that despite all safety improvements at locations such as Boscombe Down, weather is still a major cause of aviation accidents. Therefore, I believe it is important to understand what causes us to have weather and then how it influences flight. So this evening, I have come to talk to you about meteorology and its influence on flight. I am Toby Runyard and I am very fond of this topic in meteorology at school and also as a glider pilot at Army Gliding Club Wyvern at Upaven. I would like to make it clear that meteorology is a huge topic that has been studied extensively and in great detail, but fortunately for you I only have 20 minutes this evening, so I'll only be able to touch lightly on the topic. I'll first talk about the history of meteorology, then aspects of weather including temperature, pressure and wind, then how they influence flights and finally some extreme weather examples. First though, what is the difference between weather and climate? Well, by definition, weather is the day-to-day -day changes in atmospheric conditions. For example, cloud cover, wind strength and precipitation. Climate, however, is an area's average atmospheric conditions measured over at least a 30 day period, but it's usually measured over around 30 years in most countries. A huge branch of meteorology is the study of climate change. It's too broad for me to go into this evening, but it's important to note that climate change will lead to more unpredictable weather and therefore it will make meteorology a harder subject to study. Weather has been used by thousands of years by humans. Ancient farmers used it to work out how they could get optimum growth in their plants and sailors used it to, uh, to travel quicker across the seas. But it is Aristotle who is believed to be the founder of meteorology. In around 350 BC, the philosopher produced his book, Meteorology. Although in it, he incorrectly suggested that the world is made up of only fire, water, air, earth and ether, he did describe a near perfect hydrological cycle, what we now know as the modern water cycle. He also wrote about a spherical earth and clouds and storms, but he wasn't quite sure what happened in these situations. Another key figure was Benjamin Franklin, who, after unsuccessfully attempting to view an eclipse in 1743, discovered that pressures affect storm motion and crucially, that high pressure moves differently to low pressure. He also drew an accurate map of the Gulf Stream, which brings the UK warm waters and warmer air in the winter and greatly influences British weather. However, it is Luke Howard, an English scientist, who is considered to be the father of meteorology. In 1802, he released his essay on the modification of clouds. In it, he described the appearance of many different cloud types and sketched them as seen on the right. He named them in Latin after the way they looked. For example, stratus clouds were named after their long and drawn out shape, and we still use these names to this day. It is thanks to these three figures that we now have a modern understanding of our weather. But our weather is much different to the way that these three described, so I'd now like to talk about this. First is temperature. Interestingly, heat is different to temperature. Heat is the energy that can be spread over a large or small volume. Heat in a small volume creates a high temperature. So, air high in the atmosphere is at lower pressure and therefore higher volume, and therefore heat is absorbed over a larger volume of air. So we have different temperatures at different altitudes in the atmosphere, which causes, causes us to have different atmospheric layers. You can see them in the diagram on the right. Highest up at 10,000 kilometres, we have the near vacuum exosphere. It's pretty much space and it's where our satellites orbit. Then we have the thermosphere where you can see northern lights and then the mesosphere where meteors burn up. Lower down is the stratosphere 
And finally, ranging up to about 20 kilometres, is the troposphere. That's where our aircraft fly and is also where all of our weather occurs. So I'll be talking about this area most this evening. We have different temperatures across the range of the surface of the Earth due to different latitudes. At the equator, the sun is almost always directly overhead, so heat is absorbed over a smaller area. But at higher latitudes, the same amount of heat is absorbed over a large area due to the curvature. So we have an uneven rate of heating. This is furthered by the fact that at higher latitudes, there is more ice and glacier cover and hence more heat is reflected and there is an even greater uneven amount of heating. This in turn leads to us having uneven rates of air rising and cooling and therefore the earth has an unstable atmosphere. This is why we have different pressures. Descending air causes high pressure and it's usually dry and rising air creates low pressure and is usually moist. At the equator where we have a higher temperature air is forced to rise and as it does so it creates a belt it creates sorry it creates a belt of low pressure the air and water vapor cause to condense and form clouds and precipitation as it rises it then moves northwards to around 30 degrees latitude where it sinks and creates a belt of high pressure from here it can then even move southwards back to the equator to replace the moving air and to complete the hadley cell or it can move northwards to around 60 degrees where it meets the polar front. Because it is warm, especially when compared to the freezing air from the poles, it moves upwards over it, again creating a belt of low pressure, lots of rain and clouds. And from here, it either moves to complete the feral cell or it moves upwards to the North Pole where it will sink under gravity and form some of the strongest winds on Earth. It's also important to note that at about 60 degrees latitude, just north of the UK, there's a fast moving belt of air called the jet stream. It moves northwards and southwards throughout the year, but it's important to note that when it does come over us, it does bring bad weather and it's something pilots have to look out for. And then there's wind. Wind moves from high pressure to low pressure, trying to cancel out differences in the atmosphere. But it's not quite as simple as that, due to something that you may have heard of as the Coriolis effect. It's quite a complex idea to get your head around, but I'll try my best to describe it now. At the equator, the surface and the air above it are moving at 1,670 kilometers per hour. But at the North Pole, they're moving at zero kilometers per hour. Over such a large distance, this may not sound like quite a lot, but we have to understand that weather systems cover most of this area, and therefore the movement of air is greatly affected. So, air moving in the Hadley cell from around 60 degrees latitude back to the equator is forced to turn right. It bends, curving to form a westerly, an easterly moving westward wind, something the Victorian sailors named the trade winds. It carried them quickly from Africa to South America with slaves in their ships, a sad fact, but a true one. Or air will move northwards to around 30 degrees latitude and it curves right and when combined with air moving across the Gulf Stream from the Gulf of Mexico, it forms the UK's prevailing southwesterly wind. In the winter, however, when the high pressure region from the North Pole expands, we get a prevailing wind from the north known as the polar wind. So in the northern hemisphere, due to friction and drag from fast moving air, air is forced to turn right. So we get differently spinning systems and importantly, High pressure and low pressure can overlap and create regions of serious uh, thunderstorms and rain and winds. This is things that pilots always have to look out for. So you've now been given a brief overview of meteorology in the atmosphere, but how does this influence our flight? First off is temperature. Temperature variations can be extremely dangerous. Take ice, for example. Almost all pilots are advised to never fly in a cloud on a cold day. If they did, they would end up with ice on their wings and this would affect the shape of the wing, therefore causing less lift and the likelihood of a stall or a spin. And these can be deadly to pilots. For commercial aircraft, however, 
they are often forced to fly through clouds, even on cold days. We've managed to overcome this using anti-ice liquids on wings, but engines still work less effectively in the cold. So we have to prepare for this. Temperature can also be unhelpful in terms of lift. If you look at the diagram on the right, we can see that on a cold day, there is more air and therefore the air is more dense. So there's more lift on a wing as seen in the equation for lift. But when the temperature is higher, there's less air and it's a lower density and there's therefore less air to create lift. So we get less lift. But temperature can actually be helpful to lighter aircraft and gliders. The dew point is the altitude at which a thermal will peak. It's where clouds will condense and it usually forms the base of a cloud. If there is a high difference between the temperature of a day and the temperature at which these clouds condense, then we get larger thermals that are more useful for pilots. Similarly, on a warmer day, air is less stable, so thermal activity is greater and thermals are more useful to glider pilots. Pressure must also be considered. Altimeter settings for commercial aircraft are defined by pressure in something known as flight levels. On a high pressure day, a flight level is higher than it would be on an average day. But on a low pressure day, when the pressure at sea level is lower, flight levels are at lower altitudes. This may cause them to overlap and intercept with other flight zones. In these zones may be flying lighter aircraft pilots, and it's the responsibility of these lighter aircraft pilots to prepare on a low pressure day to avoid these flight levels. General weather is also defined by pressure. You can see that in the diagram on the right. On a high pressure day, air is sinking and it's dry. So there's not much precipitation and also not many clouds and we get calm, clear weather. But on a low pressure day, when air is rising and moisture is cooling, we get stormy and cloudy weather and often with rain. You might think that pilots should avoid these low pressure days, but actually for glider pilots and lighter aircraft pilots, high pressure days are useless because air is stable and thermals don't really form. So glider pilots look for something in between where rain does not compromise thermal activity. Wind is another critical factor and possibly the most dangerous of all weather factors. The speed of wind can affect the approach and takeoff speed of an aircraft. The higher the speed, the quicker we take off. The speed of a wind can also make a circuit longer. They may have to fly on the downwind approach for longer. And it can also make taxiing more difficult. If the speed of a wind is extremely high, then an aircraft that is taxiing can be blown around on the tailplane and fin, therefore causing difficulties on the ground. The direction of wind can be seen through something at most airfields as a windsock which is usually bright orange and acts like a flag. Pilots use this to know which direction they should land in as we always land into wind and take off into wind also, at least wherever we can as possible. It will also define which runway is being used at airports. It's also interesting uh, to find out that higher up at, uh, in the UK uh, towards the north, there are differently facing runways than in the south of the UK. That's because we get more wind from the north, uh, from the North Pole in the north of the UK and in the south of the UK, we get more often wind from the southwest. So there's differences in prevailing wind across the UK and difference in runway use. For pilots that have to land out, though, due to an engine failure, they don't have access to the windsock at an airfield. So they have to use the movement of shadows of clouds across the ground and also the bending of trees to see which direction the wind is going so they can land into it. But this can be extremely difficult, so it's important that pilots understand the direction the wind is blowing before they take off. Thirdly is wind shear or wind gradient. The higher up you go, the less obstacles there are and therefore the faster the wind can travel. So on takeoff, pilots must, be, must prepare for a sudden increase in the speed of wind and they must be ready to counter this. And finally, the most dangerous of them is curlover. Curlover occurs when wind blows over an obstacle and it spirals behind it. In the diagram at the bottom, you can see that this spiralling occurs for about 20 times the height of the object in distance behind it. 
and this is a huge amount, especially when considering that these obstacles are usually hangers. At Uphaven, when coming into land on, some, on certain days, we land close to the hangers, and there's often curl over. But we've learned to overcome this uh, using a higher approach speed so we can get through this area quicker, and also using air brakes to stabilise the approach. But it's still extremely dangerous, and pilots must learn about curl over before they fly. Finally, fronts and clouds have an influence on the previous impacts and their severities. There are about four different weather fronts, but the image on the right is of one of a warm front, and I'll use this as an example. A warm front occurs when warm air is approaching on cold air. Depending on the angle at which the warm air rises over the cold air will change what weather we have. If the warm air is forced to, uh, to rise quickly over the cold air at a greater angle, we'll get serious amounts of uh, rain, wind and also larger clouds. But if the angle is lower, then the warm air will rise slower and we'll get less clouds, less wind and less rain, and it will generally be a calmer day. This leads nicely to different cloud formations caused by weather fronts. You may be able to see many different uh, types of cloud in the bottom left in the image. The large one is labelled cumulonimbus, but it's often known by pilots as the anvil cloud. It brings thunderstorms, lots of rain and strong winds, but to glider pilots it often seems appealing as it has really strong thermals beneath it. But we've learned that these thermals are so strong that they can drag pilots into the cloud and into the danger of ice, which as we've described earlier, can be extremely dangerous. So it's important that we avoid these anvil clouds. Higher up clouds like cirrocumulus and cirrus clouds generally don't have much effect, but lower down cumulus and nimbostratus clouds have good thermals and often rain, but not enough to compromise the thermals. So we use these most in gliding. Finally, I'd like to talk about some extreme weather examples. First is lightning and thunderstorms, which are a no-go for all pilots and lighter aircraft. Sometimes though, commercial aircraft have had to fly through lightning and thunderstorms if it's impossible to avoid it. Luckily though, for passengers on board, they often have Faraday cages in their structure and therefore, in the event of a lightning strike, passengers are secure and safe. But for glider pilots, we don't have this and therefore it's best not to fly on a day where there's lightning and thunderstorm chances. Then there's hail and snow. Any form of precipitation is bad news for a pilot. It can bring less lift on a wing and cause stalling and spinning, which, as we've said, can be deadly. But hail and snow are extreme examples of this. Like ice, they can freeze through a cloud and are more easily collectible on a wing. So it's more dangerous for pilots and we should avoid them. Thirdly is fog. Fog causes low visibility and at an airfield, you won't be able to land or take off safely if there's fog and you won't be able to see other aircraft. So on a foggy day, pilots generally don't fly. And finally, it's heat waves. Heat waves can affect the composite structures of an aircraft. They can flex them and they can become unshaped. But heat waves also touch on another fond topic of mine, which is human factors. The canopy of an of a, uh, aircraft can act like a greenhouse. It can cause sunburn on a pilot and also make them lightheaded. If a pilot suddenly becomes lightheaded and dizzy, they should land immediately, but preferably they won't fly on a day with a heat wave. So you now have a better understanding of the history of meteorology, aspects of weather, including temperature, pressure and wind, then how they influence flight and how pilots have managed to overcome this, but also what they should avoid. And finally, some extreme weather examples that all pilots should avoid. I'd like to finish with a video of some commercial aircraft being affected by wind.
Thank you very much for watching, and I'd now like to open up to any questions. Great, thanks very much, Toby. And that, that's a, a, a really um, great exposition of a completely, a really broad topic, actually. So uh, uh, thank you very much for, for covering it for us. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an ex-Glider pilot myself, so there are a couple of things I, I'd like to uh, uh, discuss with you. And the, the first one I'd just like to ask is around um, when you're um, looking to gain lift in a glider um, through um, uh, flying underneath cumulus clouds. My first question is, how do you actually find the right area in which to circle to get the best lift? Um, well, that's quite an interesting question and something that I'm still trying to learn for, um, for going cross country as it's important you can find them. Um, so generally we look out for areas where there's likely to be uh, uh, lifting air. So uh, farms and pig farms often have rising air and it's generally where a a bubble of air will pop and rise uh, so also shiny areas like lakes and the sea will have uh, lift um, and also ridges so air going up a ridge will be deflected northward uh, not northwards upwards um, and create a ridge lift so that's something we can go over um, but also for thermals uh, because gliders are quite like um, birds we often look out for birds flying as well so a couple of times I've been in a thermal of a bird and that's quite exciting as well. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks very much. And by the way, um, as with our previous presenter, I, I encourage our audience to ask questions uh, via the Q&A as well. So, um, so that's, that's um, uh, one way of getting lift. You talked about ridge lift as well. Um, there's another one um, I wouldn't mind uh, uh, reviewing with you and that's mountain wave. And uh, are you able to give me a sort of brief description about how that works? Um, I'll try my best. I think that's that's not something I've uh, dealt with before, but I I believe I should I should, well I should know what it is. Um, well, that's generally I think that's quite similar to ridge um, flying, and that's where the air is moving up a mountain, and as it does so, like a wing, it has to travel really quickly upwards over it. So as it does so, it raises quickly, and pilots can use this as it moves upwards to use it to to climb. Excellent. OK, thank you. Um, in fact, I've got another question uh, from my, uh, my uh, co-judge. Uh, so someone asks, can you tell me something about how temperature affects aircraft and engine performance? Um, yeah, so with engine performance, I believe that's quite similar to how a wing works as well. So the higher the density, the more uh, an engine can, the engine can be more effective as there's more air to squeeze and push up the back. But on so that so on a cold temperature day, uh, it'll be more effective. But on a high temperature day, when the air is lower density, uh, they'll be less effective. So it's quite similar to a wing. No, thank you for that. That's absolutely right. And uh, yeah, density altitude is a is a, a key factor um, for both engine performance and, of course, also for helicopters in, in particular. Um, one of the things um, I, uh, I, I enjoyed about uh, your description was actually how it works on a on a planetary basis. Um, and you talked about the um, the trade winds, um, but also you also hear uh, sailors talking about the doldrums as well. Do you know how that, that those two are inter interrelated? Um, that's a very good question. Unfortunately, I don't actually know what the doldrums are, so I apologise for apologise oh. for that. <laughs> That's fine. And th those are areas of, of calm in between the cells that you talked about, um, right. where, uh, where sailors are obviously have the opposite effect of uh, opposite problem of, of not having enough wind. Um, so um, th that's been a, a really good uh, run through. I'm just waiting to see if we get any more uh, questions um, on uh, the, the Q&A. Um, and um, I'll say thanks very much again for uh, a really good uh, insight into that broad topic. So thanks very much. what we'll do, um, we've just about come to the end of the time for presentations. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, disappear with my fellow judge to um, review um, the um, uh, uh, to review all of the uh, presentations uh, and to deliberate over the results. But I'm afraid, uh, but. You'll be, you'll be glad to know I've got one final question for you. Um, and that's uh, come from a member of our audience um, who asks, how do you think the increased power of computing will assist pilots in real time weather forecasting and weather data to improve safety and efficiency? Uh, well, that's an excellent point and uh, something that 
I, I'm quite interested in and how that would change because as I mentioned at the start the number of accidents has actually increased um, but I believe that the increase in weather safety through forecasting will uh, result in less accidents because um, well also for larger aircraft we have they have radars that can uh, help them avoid uh, large thunderstorms and areas of like high uh, dangerous weather um, so if the, the more easy that becomes to use the more lighter aircraft pilots can use it too and therefore it's easier for all pilots to avoid serious weather uh, so I believe that better forecasting is definitely going to lead to less accidents. Great thanks very much